everyone and welcome. I'm going to just give a few brief remarks before we get into the session. So welcome everyone to the Advocacy and Accountability Subcommittee's Community Session. And um, we are really excited to be part of the Not Without FP Virtual Forum. We hope you're staying healthy and well. And my name is Kate Barrett, and I am a program officer with Advanced Family Planning and one of the co-chairs of the International Conference on Family Planning's Advocacy and Accountability Subcommittee. We will soon give an overview of the session and then break into roundtable discussion groups on different topics related to advocacy and accountability. But first, I wanted to give a little background about the subcommittee. We are one of the many subcommittees for ICFP, and the main aim of our subcommittee is to initiate and coordinate efforts to highlight the role of advocacy and accountability during ICFP at the global, regional, national, and subnational levels to ensure access to voluntary quality family planning information, services, and supplies in the context of sexual, reproductive, and reproductive health and rights. We as a subcommittee will reconvene around our specific objectives for the next ICFP after this virtual forum. There might be a slight hiatus um, as there's ongoing discussions about whether or not to postpone um, once again the next conference. So if you're not already a member of the subcommittee and would like to join, uh, please email me and I'll put my email in the chat. And for those of you who are already members, thank you for your help organizing this session and other sessions, and we will be back in touch soon. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Liz Tully. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you all so much for joining us in this round table session. Um, we're really excited for you to be part of all of these um, conversations that we'll be having. Um, and please, we are here in this space all together. We need about 20 minutes of your time to get you sorted into the topic that most um, excites you. So please be patient. We um, are so glad you're here. And I have a few instructions on how we're going to get all set up this um, today. So with before I start um, into those instructions, I just wanted to say that if you have highlights from this session um, and you want and you're one of the people who are on social media sharing hashtags, um, please do use this um, hashtag that's on the screen, ICFPAA. Um, so we welcome all of those. Um, so now on to how do we get you into the different topics? So we have a number of topics here. We have 12 different topics. Some are duplicate. You'll see that there are duplicate versions of some topics that we thought might be um, especially popular. And then there are topics um, that are both facilitated in English, and then there are separate uh, roundtables of that same topic that will be in French. So we hope that all of these um, different options will suit you. So here is how you select the, the topic that interests you most. Um, I will walk you through the process, and then I'm going to open up this slide deck to you so that you can make the selection yourself. So everyone's going to need to open up this link when I put it into the chat. So what I'm going to do is ask you to review the topics on slide three. So we have all of these different topics on the slide three. And if you were most interested in how can FP programs continue to advocate when COVID is overwhelming everything, you would say, okay, I need to go to slide nine. So I'm going to go to what would be slide nine, and this is considered round table six. So this is going to be a table that you can manually type your name into the box. Each one of these is a cell, it's a table. So you would enter your name, and if, it's fill, if every single spot is filled, then you need to find a new topic that you're interested in. So we only have, um, 15 spots in each round table. Um, so then you would go back to your the main slide here and select something else and enter your name. So oh, thank you so much, Lee, uh, Liz, and thank you so much, everyone. I will hand it back to Lithia and then I'll connect with you all a bit later. So thank you. Welcome, Lithia. Thank you, Patricia. Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome to this Advocacy and Accountability Roundtable discussion on what's working in family planning and UHC advocacy. My name is Lethia Bernard, and I lead the UHC Engage Project at PAI. Today, I'm joined by my colleague and co-facilitator, Patricia Nudia-Raro, 
policy and advocacy lead at KMET. As colleagues under the UHC Engage project, we've learned alongside one another what's working for cross-country and cross-regional SP advocates as we navigate together the new national level policies governments around the world are introducing toward universal health coverage and chart together advocacy entry points to ensure decision makers design policies that advance universal access to family planning. We know these country specific UHC reforms yield unprecedented opportunities to improve rights based access to family planning and we're excited for this open space to share and learn amongst colleagues about family planning advocacy experiences strategies and lessons learned advocating for family planning as a priority as UHC programs and policy reforms evolve at the country level. But before Patricia leads us in discussion, I'm going to review a few housekeeping notes to, to guide our discussion, which will hopefully um, keep things running smoothly. The first is that we ask you to please use the hand raise function when you'd like to contribute to the conversation. And that's located at the bottom of, of the Zoom screen. Please also feel free to use the chat function to engage with one another um, if you agree or want to build on a point. Uh, I will also be monitoring the, the chat box for questions that participants um, pose and feeding them up to Patricia as she moderates our conversation. Please also mute your microphone when you're not speaking to reduce the background noise. And in terms of the camera, if it is possible, it'd be great to see uh, everybody's faces so we can interact with one another. But if not, that's also fine. Uh, and we ask you please limit your comments to um, one to two minutes given our limited time. We're trying to make the most of the conversation and hear as much as we can possibly from, from everybody else. Um, so in terms of introducing one another to, to ourselves, we ask you to do so via the chat function introduce your name and an organizational affiliation. And we also have a map um, annotation function. So if you so choose um, at the top of the Zoom window, you can click on the view options, click annotate, click on the stamp button and the star, and then you are able to choose uh, your country location on the map. So we have a visual of seeing where we're, where we're all hailing from, from afar. So as, as we let everyone um, uh, mark, mark where, they're, where they're coming from and introduce themselves via the chat, I'll hand over to Patricia to lead us through the discussion this morning. Thank you so much, Lithia. Thank you, everyone. Uh, today, we just want to have a chat around uh, universal health coverage implementation uh, with a bias towards family planning and what uh, advocacy plans are going on within our different countries. And so given that I'm coming from Kenya, I will begin with uh, briefly uh, in two minutes just letting you know what's going on in Kenya. And then maybe you can think about your different countries and share with us in under two minutes as uh, Lithia said. Uh, so Kenya is uh, located in East Africa and uh, has a devolved uh, health unit. So health is both at the national level and at the subnational levels. Uh, at the national level, there is the policy function and the governing of the referral facilities, as well as uh, uh, capacity building for the different counties. Uh, so in Kenya, uh, health is much, much, much devolved. And, and so uh, our priority during this phase uh, is uh, universal health coverage. And we started by having uh, four pilot counties that were just taken through, uh, given some funding to be able to offer uh, 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 universal health coverage to their uh, constituents. And uh, there are a couple of lessons learned, and those are the ones that I want to measure on uh, today. Uh, one of it, uh, because uh, health was uh, looked at as an issue of uh, of uh, making it free because out of pocket expenditure was not very sustainable. And so most of the counties uh, opted to make it free uh, completely for indigents. Um, but we found that that is not sustainable and uh, insurance based uh, uh, mod, uh, model is uh, the most appropriate. Uh, there was also a lot of issues around curative, uh, preventive and promotive and which one to focus on. Uh, the pilot focused a lot on curative. Uh, we found that to not work very well, that we needed to at least focus on uh, promotive and preventive uh, healthcare 
as well and fam family planning uh, falls squarely on that. So that was also seen to be a major gap. Uh, in our different uh, universal health coverage, we didn't start with an essential benefits package, and that has caught up with time. Uh, although the national uh, one does not have family planning, the counties are beginning to include family planning in their essential benefits package. There was also an issue around commodity security, uh, uh, the fact that commodities are not very readily available. Uh, but that, that was also looked up as something that needed to be worked on because there was heavy reliance on aid, uh, donor funding, and, and so there was need to do domestic financing. And that led to uh, Kisumu County, for example, where I come from, developing a costed implementation plan to be able to have an implementation framework that is costed to be able to run uh, family planning issues. We also uh, uh, learned that leadership and governance is a huge factor when it comes to uh, universal health coverage and uh, family planning incorporation. And so that is also something that was flagged as a recommendation that we look at critically at leadership and governance, governor's manifestos, the president's manifesto, and make sure that health is a critical factor in that. And lastly, the issue of uh, primary health care being a pillar of universal health coverage that we don't need to focus very much on curative, but rather focus on preventive and promotion and make sure that we have sufficient human resource and also community health um, uh, investment. So in a snapshot, that is our lessons from Kenya. And at this uh, juncture, I will open it up. Uh, to anyone who has their lessons learned from their different countries. I see we are from everywhere all over the world. And so if uh, anyone would want to share their individual country experiences, feel free to do that. Uh, if there's anything I've left from Kenya and you're from Kenya, you can also chime in so that we begin the discussion from what are some of the lessons learned, what is coming out from the different countries and what can we both learn. Uh, from what is happening in the county. So at this point, I will open up the floor uh, to all of us to be able to chime in into the discussion. Thank you. And just a quick reminder to use the raise hand function. And now I'll be looking through the participant list to see um, who, to, um, who goes first. Okay, so as we wait for uh, any, anyone to share their individual country experiences, is there anything uh, from the lessons learned that you have you can be able to uh include into these discussions around family planning and universal health coverage it does not have to be your country experience but anything that you have seen to have worked uh in any space or sphere or according to your learnings so that you may be able to start that discussion from there uh Hi, everyone. Um, I would love to hear from Patricia a little bit more kind of about how things are going in Kisumu and how you see this being able to be scaled up across Kenya. Okay, thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, uh, one of the things that I've seen happen in Kisumu is ownership for health uh, has been uh, really high, especially within the political class. Uh, so we have seen uh, the political class uh, investing in in uh, in making sure that indigents receive care, and so we have a scheme uh, that is known as Marua. Marua it, it means uh, this is ours, and, and uh, technically they have uh, taken eighty eight thousand indigents that are not able to afford insurance to be able to pay insurance for them, uh, uh, so that they are able to access care. Uh, so there was a, an assessment that was done and those were uh, the people that could not pay at all. Uh, but we have an, uh, our National Health Insurance Fund that is also uh, really uh, picking up within the county because there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, campaign around it for everyone to have insurance. In fact, we passed our Health Act uh, in uh, 2019 and it mandates everyone in Kisumu County to be able to have an insurance. So. In the pilot, uh, it was really uh, felt that health needed to be free. So uh, you walk into a facility, you get free services. That did not work really well because we know free uh, when free services are given, someone is paying. And when that someone stops paying, then that is not very sustainable. So uh, Kisumu County is uh, adopting an insurance-based uh, model and, and is able to cater to the people who cannot be able to pay. 
uh, and then the people who can pay then begin to pay. Uh, so uh, what we are is happening right now in Kisumu is we are developing regulations around the health act because it mandates everyone in Kisumu County to have an insurance, but it doesn't say the how. Uh, so uh, we are developing regulations around the essential benefits package, and we are happy to report that family planning is one uh, of the least, it has made it to the list, and like the uh, national uh, essential benefits package that does not include family planning expressly. Uh, and, and we are hoping that within the different insurance scheme, family planning then becomes a mandatory service that will be given to uh, indigents and also to the different insurance schemes and there is a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, talk around uh, how can we then ensure that the quality of services are, are um, uh, uh, the, the quality of services are assured assured and that uh, everyone who walks into a facility is sure to get the service. So right now we have a costed implementation plan that we are also happy to have uh, partnered with PAI to launch in Kisumu County. Uh, that is a, uh, that we are now advocating for resources to be able to uh, to uh, uh, operationalize so that we get to a point that we are self reliant when it comes to family planning because in Kenya. Family planning commodities have been uh, really a, a, a subject of the national government through donor funding. And we want to make sure that uh, as we begin to talk about around issues of commodities, issues of services, then we are sure that uh, we can be able to uh, afford this even if we don't get external funding. So in a snapshot, that is where Kisumu County is at. Uh, there's so much going on and everything changing every single day. And we are hopeful that with uh, assurance that there is investments and all that, then we will now work on making sure that the quality of services are assured and that we are uh, strengthening the primary health care because we have also real, uh, we, are, we also realized a huge budget for primary health care that were never there previously. And we also managed to get a RAMCA, a reproductive health ma uh, maternal health funding for the last financial year. So we are pushing this year to have uh, 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 some funding for family planning specifically and begin to operationalize our very new uh, costed implementation plan for family planning. So in a snapshot, that is what is happening in Kisumu. And I'm happy to take any questions if there's any. Thanks for sharing, Patricia. Noting a comment from, from Peter Ngure, uh, proud of the good work by KMET Indeed, having one county start and show that UHC with family planning can work will help other counties learn and use the same model or even an improved one to better the lives of their people. Um, fully agree, Peter, and echo the sentiment. Any other observations from, from anyone, even in terms of what, um, what their priority should be for, for advocates in this era of UHC? Any kinds of... Um, um, notes or um, that focus the nurse. Um, unfortunately, I cannot see the icon for raising hand. That is why I'm just popping in. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for you know uh, allowing me to bring up my contribution on board. Uh, it's uh, just um, uh, an inquiry from uh, Patricia and uh, first. Uh, go ahead to compliment her work and they uh, really that is a very great job and uh, we are happy at least uh, we are getting learnings from that and uh, my name is Aisha Nansamba I'm a Ugandan you know close to to, to Kenya uh, and I work with BRAC International as uh, so my my, my uh, it is kind of uh, more of uh, a food for thought and uh, trying to inquire if someone on uh, on uh, on the uh, around has some details. Most of the times when we are designing say preventive health care and then uh, access to, to, to family planning, the concentration is too much on the women and uh, yet in the African setting, we know so much that uh, the, 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 the patriarchy has dominated and there is that great influence that comes from patriarchy. So are there any uh, any discussions ongoing related to how the gender dynamics will be dealt with to encourage the uptake? Because right now it's, uh, you know, there is that full focus of getting access on board and of quality, 
So the services will be there, but uh, anything in mind related to how the gender dynamics will be dealt with in particular, you know, how the males get on board to support, you know, the advocacy and also to, to, to increase the uptake, uh, which is the intended, you know, maybe outcome that you're looking at. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think I'll, I'll throw this back to us. Uh, anyone who has any uh, kind of uh, input around what has been asked, uh, feel free to unmute and, and go right ahead and share. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll probably uh, go in with my two cents. Maybe Alicia also has uh, something to add. Uh, Peter is also here. You, you can add something. Uh, but I think uh, that we cannot ignore uh, the role patriarchy plays uh, in terms of uh, access to services. Uh, it, it's not only enough to have services available at the facility. There is need uh, for us to create demand around those services. And we live in communities where if uh, maybe a man says you are not going to get a family planning method, you will not get the family planning method. Uh, so we, we have to, uh, of course, train men along. And, and also make sure that we realize that, uh, that even as we bring men into this discussion, uh, there is the other part of not uh, uh, making it seem as if uh, women need permission to be able to get uh, these services. And so there is the, uh, a balance that needs to be struck there. And so, for example, in my experience, I've found that community conversations work uh, to be able to just understand why is there uh, so much patriarchy entrenched in our system, uh, what informs it? How can we go about it? Because at the end of the day, uh, when a woman uh, has access to family planning, then it's for the benefit of the entire community. It's not only for the benefit of one woman or one family. Uh, when we have manageable families, then it's uh, the ripple effect is that everyone in the society then benefits from that. And so from that angle, it becomes a community issue when, when uh, patriarchy uh, comes into the way of accessing services. And I think these conversations need to be had because at times uh, there, there are comments that are made out of complete ignorance. And I think we then need to ensure that we uh, debunk uh, family planning, the role of men and male involvement in it, and to make sure that our communities really understand uh, what value it is that it adds when when uh, women access family planning. Yeah, and I'll pass it back to Lithia. I see Peter has a comment uh, in the comment uh, box. Thank you. Right, I see Peter is Peter saying, I think engaging men under UHC must be prioritized, especially knowing the power and economic dynamics around funding the UHC package. In Kenya, it's around $60 a year, and thus men must be encouraged to pay for their households, even as we push to ensure women are economically empowered and thus not rely on, on husbands. I yeah, just, I completely agree. Yes, I also see that our colleague Remy has, has their hand raised. Remy, go ahead. Uh, good, good day, everyone. I really appreciate uh, your comments and all that you have been uh, presenting. Uh, my own contribution is just about finding out at the community level their religious perspective about family planning. During my years of, uh, of working on family planning in some villages where I've worked in Lagos, some rural villages, they prefer a child spacing rather than call it family planning because of the misconception. And again, we have to listen to them to make their ideas valuable so that we can be able to access the clients and the clients to be able to access the family planning clinics. Also, I believed in community-based distribution of commodities through the volunteer health workers. More so now that there is lockdown because most of us working in the rural villages because of the pandemic and the uh, precautionary methods, we don't want to gather people to talk to them again. 
So we can make use of the volunteer health workers and also we can make use of our telephone, texting, you know, the new uh, tools, you know, checking on them where they can get services or uh, who we can give, who, you know, just to have the data like somebody presented. Uh, is it in uh, one of the presentation that says they now have a uh, data rather than use the art copies so we can have data as well. And I'm also thinking during this time of COVID-19, we can explore the use of media. I used it a lot, especially radio jingles uh, in the language they understand, you know, talking on radios, talking on television, you know, and also advocacy. Advocacy now things have changed because most government, even at the local, the state and the national level, they're now working from home due to lockdown. But messaging, texting, you know, advocating for changes, advocating for commodities at the, uh, the uh, community, community health facilities. Because yesterday I had a lady from Nigeria that it was difficult for her to access uh, family planning, um, um, you know, to access family planning that she went to about three health facilities. But, you know, I will say, uh, especially the side of, you know, Southwest, that we have come a long way in family planning. And also family planning education should be geographically, you know, looked into. For example, religion plays a part where some people believe you must have the number of children you have. It's okay so far you are able to cater for them according to family planning. But in that instance, you can have some parts of the region having like uh, maybe 15, 20 children per family or 30, and some just having two because of our new, you know, educated uh, young elites. So those are just my few contributions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Remy. Those are really uh, valuable points. And I agree with you on certain things you mentioned around language, using language that is sensitive uh, to the communities that, that we serve, among the other great points that you've mentioned. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and I think we have uh, hoped towards now the strategies of improving access uh, to family planning without within UHC. Uh, so maybe we could just uh, go on with uh, the strategies, what do you think works, uh, and, and how can we then implement it in our different day-to-day uh, -day work. So the, the floor is open. Patricia was prompting um, a, a question about um, strategies, advocacy strategies in this uh, era of, of UHC and, and um, you know, any, any sort of lessons learned or insight that, that we've gathered over the years that we can employ together as we're advancing the various um, considerations that our colleagues have already highlighted as um, community level programs and policies are, are being designed. What do we know now that we can carry forward with us in this journey? We have to learn what the people have been doing. And I'm sure, you know, it's acceptable in all countries as well. Before the modern method of family planning, our people have, been, have their own methods of preventing pregnancies or of, uh, you know, child spacing, so to say, in some other communities. So we have to learn from them again about that and to let them know that these uh, new methods research has really gone on it and they are been proven to be effective and we have to dispel rumors that is very very important surrounding family planning and also i feel it must start not when one is married from the adolescent only we have to or uh, know how to package the information, education to maybe adolescent girls, even the boys as well. And uh, how to, you know, now that the pandemic, <clears throat> sorry, is uh, very much around, we can't do under the tree meetings much again. 
But then uh, observing protocols, we can send messages via uh, um, text messaging by telephone that they are used to and their favorite channels. There are some local channels that, you know, people in the rural area, for example, listen more to radio. So we can reach them through the radios as well and get the people themselves involved, like training uh, family planning advocates, family planning volunteers, their jobs may be different. They can still see each other one-on-one, -on -one, you know, observing all measures, you know, six feet apart, putting on masks and all that. And with what I learned from my daughter as well, because age is advancing on me now too, I'm 68, is that, you know, most uh, policy works is now done via uh, internet, maybe Zoom and all that. We can still employ that more on to, until we're a bit free to, to kind of uh, now wanting to come together because we have to admit that this pandemic has really affected all of us. And I, during the course of the study, I mean, of, of the presentation, I, you know, I, we were told how the percentage of the unmet needs has widened during this uh, COVID uh, pandemic. And also we have to work with the local chemists because this is where the people go first to train them, you know, some of them, we cannot close their shops just like that. They're working with the government, especially the Ministry of Health. I think we can work with the chemists because in Nigeria, we have access to chemists. Within five houses or 10 houses, you see, a, a, you know, a chemist there, one way or the other, it helps is when I got to a regulated place that I know some, you know, maybe two regulated systems sometimes affects people's health. That's my observation. You have to go to the clinic, the drug has to be ordered by the doctor, da, 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 da. but the whole essence of primary health care is for people to take responsibility for their own health. So some of these maybe pills, the softer, family planning devices, maybe we now train the chemist very well on how to do this. So that's, uh, and male involvement is very important. That is not just for the wife, but both of them coming together is not only on uh, commodities, it's about fertility as well. It's about uh, uh, family, you know, planning, I mean, um, you know, not only for the uh, choices, I mean, for the, um, for the, for the uh, devices they are taking, but how to plan their life. They, they, we have to stress the, uh, the, the usefulness of family planning, you know, that it's kind of a life, a lifelong process, you know, by, whereby when they have their children at the choice time, you know, are they, you know, spaced, they can plan for the schooling, they can plan you know, for their university, they can plan so that most of this violence we are having among youths now will be greatly reduced because we've had so many young youths. You know? So that's my humble contribution. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Remy. Uh, you raise a very good point. And uh, what has stuck out is, uh, is how you have kept on mentioning the issue of young people and access. Uh, and and the, the, we know that there are really, truly many barriers to access uh, uh, fami uh, or family planning among the young people. And thank you for uh, the insights uh, that you bring to this debate. Uh, anyone else who has any strategies around uh, access, any question up to this point that you might, you might want clarification on uh, so that we may be able to, to move with it. So anyone? You can just raise your hand or um, feel free to just unmute. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Patricia, in case no one else is coming in, 
for me, my icon for raising the hand failed to pop up. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I think for me, I'll be speaking more of uh, the policy related uh, issue. Uh, you spoke about, you know, how can we move their agenda forward and uh, what has really worked. When it comes to policy, policy at most is driven by data. So there should be documentation of our evidence. So we should look at, uh, you know, always bringing the evidence on board. It informs uh, the policymaker, though much as, you know, the art of politics also comes into play. We must understand what do the politicians really want for the community at the same time, uh, listen to other communities and then we are able to balance between, uh, you know, the, the, the needs because uh, there are times when uh, these two are not balancing the community is asking for something, the political agenda is different so uh, you know we always have to bring data into play to inform policy and uh, speaking again of policy engagement is very paramount. This engagement should not be at the end when we are disseminating say results, but it should start from the point of design, designing a concept note such that you walk the talk together and make sure that you're addressing, uh, you know, a vital policy related issue, which the policymaker will be at the end of the day, be accountable to the people that at least we address this policy in line to the current policy or the policy was revised in terms uh, of, uh, you know, what we are having currently, but not simply to pop up. Then, uh, the last one will echo on uh, what um, uh, Remy, Remy spoke about, uh, you know, trying to understand the communities. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, you know, the, 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 the culture norms, you know, those are things which play a critical role, but most of the times we want to say, this is what is good for you. But there are those norms which have been in play and they are strongholds, you know, strong believers who think that this is what is working. So we must always understand how do we penetrate through those cultural norms. And lastly, when you speak of the young people, uh, this particular category also has its own dynamics. We always tend that to categorize them as one, but we have the young adults and then uh, <laughs> the other ones are called them the adolescents. So these are the 10 up to 14 is a very critical age which we don't have much information about. Some of us think they are too young, yet in reality, when you go on the ground, they are no longer young. Some of them in fragile countries where I have worked, they are already you know, exposed, they are already engaging in sex, but uh, they are so naive about whatever goes on. So I think uh, those are the dynamics which programming should look into to make sure that the needs of the certain groups and categories are really addressed as needed. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Aisha. You raise a uh, very brilliant points around uh, how policy needs to be driven, uh, community engagement and meaningful engagement at that point, not at the, at the tail end, but throughout the process, uh, even before it begins at the programming stage, which uh, really is an interesting uh, uh, insight and also the involvement of young people into this debate and not clamping them as one uh, I, I, that have homogeneous needs because they have needs that vary quite a bit. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, anyone else who has some insights, just uh, feel free to unmute and uh, go right ahead. Also, just to buttress what the last speaker said, which is quite right on policy, affecting policy. I remembered working in a rural um, local government area in Lagos State. After observing the women, I saw that a lot of them were not working and it was a fishing community. They were not farming because of the saltiness of the soil and things were really bad. So after my observation at the village, I wrote uh, a compelling memo to the chairman and I sought audience with him, the chairman of the local government. So when the, I met with the local government chairman, he told me that when the money comes from the, the, the national, that you know there is a bit of delay, but 
he, he will let me know when the money comes, you know, what they will do that he had what my uh, organization, Community Health Information Education Forum, chief mm -hmm. in short, chief uh, said, and true to his words, you know, when the money came, he bought for the fishermen outboard engines for the women, uh, sewing machines, but uh, and so many other things that could propel their income generating activities. And like the last speaker rightly said, we must know what the people want. Because sometimes when you give things like that, that are free, some may sell it again, because in the community, I saw their priority. They, they catch fish, they prefer to sell it in the city while their children are malnourished. So the, 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 the orientation has to change a bit, working with the people from what they know, from what is unknown to what should be known. So, you know, let the, the suggestion come from them. At least we have some positive deviants that are missed you know, challenges, they are thriving, they are doing well. So that's just my contribution. Uh, policy is very, very vital. And also the training of the family planning providers who are sometimes health workers, because there's no program. My organization then organizes that we don't involve the health workers. You have to bring them abreast of what is happening, currently happening because some of them are working in the rural villages. Mm -hmm. So either through maybe Zooming now to let them know like programs like we are on now, this ICFP, how they can, you know, that, that's what I do now on my Facebook page. I posted it there so that whoever reads it might join the conference. So things like that, thank you. Thank you so much, Remy. Uh, those are really vital points on the need to engage community. And I think throughout these discussions, uh, we've, uh, we've seen uh, the need to engage communities because you can push a service to them, but if they don't buy into your service, then you will end up with, uh, uh, with uh, services in uh, a healthcare facility. You are right. Don't get you are right. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you so much, Remy. I will hand it back to Lithia because our time is far much spent. I see a couple of messages in the in the chat. We could go through uh, that and see if we have enough time for more comments. If we don't, then thank you so much for, for your contribution. So back to you, Lithia. Thank you, Patricia. I believe uh, our session is going to close on us in one minute. <laughs> so just to say thank you everybody for your, for your patience and your contributions. One of the things that um, that I'm struck by is that across, across comments and observations, there's this thread of truly listening and understanding um, the different needs of, 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 of the audiences, whether it's the community or the policymakers or the multifaceted, um, you know, um, members that make up who we sometimes refer to as an umbrella term, the youth. Um, all of that is is incredibly important um, in the in the makeup uh, and in the intentional um, efforts behind policy design, program design, and, and as advocates um, using our force, um, our sort of strength to to leverage all of those voices um, as we advocate for um, UHC prior or family planning priorities in this era of, of UHC. So. Of course, just the beginning of a longer term conversation, but really appreciate um, our colleagues sharing their insights uh, with us this morning and looking forward to continuing the, the conversation. And very special thanks to Patricia for guiding us through, through the conversation. And I just want to close because I know a lot of people are coming in from your breakout rooms and I just wanted to thank all of you for your patience. It just goes to show no matter how much planning goes into it, Things can just go awry and I really appreciate everyone just being loose and I hope you all had great conversations. So thank you again for joining us today and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. So thanks. Thank you.
Merci à notre groupe. Thank you. Bye. Changing because our 